I don't I don't know why, but when you when you mentioned that, my my most nostalgic scent was and this will show my age, but I guess it's coming back, so maybe it's not, is when you used to first open up a vinyl album, there was always a specific mm. smell that came from them. So you'd pull the plastic off and you'd open it up and you'd go, ah, I got a new album. Yeah. Nice. Kyle, what's a nostalgic scent for you? Nostalgic scent? Yeah. Nintendo. Oh, wait, that's not a scent. Yeah. A scent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> What what is smell an Atari you smell the like? You know, I don't know. Yeah, probably smells like mold at this point because it's so old. Um, <laughs> dust. <laughs> what does dust smell like? <laughs> I like how we're getting such nice scents coming. Smell plastic. The smell of yeah. dust. Oh, when, I, when I pull out my old games, that's what I get. Dust. <laughs> yeah. Very dusty. Very dusty. Um, you know, otherwise, you know, just the nostalgic growing up stuff, I think it's more of the, you know, mom making the cookies, you know, or sugary cereals, the other stuff that comes to mind, stuff like Fruity Pebbles and stuff like that is nostalgic. You get Fruity Pebbles yeah. anymore? Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, really? you can get Fruity Pebbles. Yeah. Flintstones are still a thing in the, the world? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's that that one survived with it. Lucky Charms is another good one. <laughs> like we've listed off a lot of things that might be potentially be carcinogens. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> Most likely. So Kelsey, what's a nostalgic scent for you? That's such a tough question right? to go. Hey, what's this one thing if I'm not smelling it? Like I feel like if you smell something, then you're like, then you'll oh, think of it. That yeah. reminds me of that. But I do agree with Kyle that I feel like food smells and I'm still remembering like going to Disneyland as a child and the fact mm. that they pump smells into Disney, which is just super fascinating to look into all of that. But where like the smell of just like, oh, it smells kind of like sugar and things in the air. You're like, that's such a happy association that I'm like, yeah. I don't know if it would make sense for my house to always smell like that. Mm -hmm. I tend to use the volcano scent so that I smell like an anthropology store instead. <laughs> this is fine. Yeah. As we've discovered in past episodes, I like to shop too much, so it all checks out. But yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I like sugary, sugary yeah. goodness. But what about you, Ariel? I was, you know, I was trying to think of like a good one because I didn't want to say burning plastic or something. <laughs> but actually, like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking like manure that sounds weird but like when they spread manure <laughs> in the fields like I grew up near farms so that's what I think of you know it's not something that I smell now but that time of year so no I, I get that, yep. that you can have like a, like it's a very strong smell too you're like yeah. you can't ignore it you know what it is but I like how we have vinyl kind of plastic <laughs> dust with a hint of cereal manure and then I'm coming in with oh by the way I like the smell of Disneyland Disneyland what a wild <laughs> group yeah. oh man I don't can, know can if we, I can I share one thing I can't stand the smell of of course sure casinos yeah I've never been to a casino smoke Ever. just think of um, oh. stale smoke yeah. that's what it smells like stale smoke with a lot of spilled drinks it's uh yeah, yeah they it's nasty and then okay. in vegas they tend to try to put this vanilla smell over the top as though that's going to fix it it's <laughs> disgusting <laughs> <laughs> you're really selling going to a casino for me i'm going yeah yeah no thanks you got to go at least once there there's my pitch <laughs> You gotta go at least I'll one. go and report back on the smell. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, this conversation started <laughs> because we were talking about our office and what scent we would want to pump in, like Disneyland. So today on our Tech for Business podcast, we're talking about tech partners um, and why you need one. So Kelsey and myself are joined by Kyle, our president and CEO, Todd, our COO and CISO. And um, before we kind of dive into why you need a tech partner, um, I just want to kind of level set, what do we mean by a tech partner? What does that mean? Because that's a big umbrella. So Kyle and Todd, when I say tech partner, what comes to mind for you? 
I can I can jump in real quick before Ty gets going here. But it's, <laughs> it's uh, um, to me it to me it's a it's an external third party group that has um, has experience or resources to assist with with skills you do not have in house. So that could be you know related to just uh, computer deployment or server deployments or server upgrades to physical security to cyber security to application development. So there's a whole, there's a, there, there's a lot there um, in a lot of different category sides of it, but it's really that uh, that external group where you reach out to to get uh, the additional expertise you just don't have in house. Um, not that I likened a, a plumber, electrician, other types of services you you would bring in, but obviously more slated towards business related services. Yeah, I tend to agree. I mean, when you first threw out the the phrase, the first thing that popped into my head was trusted partner. Um, it's that place where you would go to get additional knowledge. But it could be something that is the break fix person too, is I don't know how to break fix this. What can I lean on somebody quickly or or something that potentially is an added um service, if you will, if you have the ability to outsource a component of something you just simply can't get to. So that ad would be another thing that I would add to it. Yeah. The other analogy that, that comes to mind is you're uh, a CPA, I don't know, an accounting firm of those things where you bring in that external expertise to assist with a knowledge side of it, where there's there can be a lot of additional complexities. So you hire a CPA firm to help. Um, and that the technology partner serves in a lot of those roles as well from a strategic guidance. It's, yes. it's obviously a lot change in technology rapidly, so it can be very difficult to keep up. Yeah. For sure. So we've touched on this topic before, um, and I'll make sure to kind of link that in the description. But I sort of wanted to go through um, when we're talking about businesses, I kind of think about small, medium, large, you know, and what a tech partner, why those may or may not need a tech partner, what pros and cons come for each of those sizes. So starting out with kind of the small business, I'm thinking like when I think of small business, I think of like mom and pop. There's like two to five employees. They probably got a guy named Bob who knows how to turn the computer on and off. Like that's their level of IT. Um, why would a company like that need a tech partner? Well, you kind of you kind of got into it. They they got somebody that knows how to turn on and off, but all the rest <laughs> of it they really don't know how to do. And this scales into the the large side too. It it is kind of like into that. The technology change is so rapid that they're just they don't know what they don't know. Is that's kind of the, the simplest term side with it. So by by engaging and having a tech a, a tech partner, the tech partner is constantly getting information on industry changes, new technology shifts from key vendors and new solutions that potentially could be introduced into their business side of it. By having regular cadence and conversations and engagement with tech party, you're going to get some insight as to how that technology can assist their business, because most likely they're not doing technology as their business. So they have, you know, whether they're, you know, repairing cars or they're an HVAC shop or whatever it may be, they got their their knowledge that they're delivering, and um, the tech partner brings in the technology information to help them. Yeah, the what I'd expand on there is is very similar, but I, I would add that they do typically have their hands full. They those individuals typically are wearing all the hats, so it's not multiple hats where you'll see in some business they're wearing all of them. And to your point, bringing in Bob, he's typically going to be a friend or somebody down the street or a neighbor or somebody like that. Um, and he may have some some stuff in place. He may not. Um, a great example is I was talking to a, a smaller org that we, we don't even actually do business with, um, and they were kind of complaining about some things that we're dealing with in this particular case. It ended up being their internet connection, and they just had an old, I don't, I don't even remember the vendor, I'll just say Comcast, and I'm not picking on Comcast, don't sue me, please. Um, but they had an old... <laughs> old internet provider had a very small bandwidth on it. And over the years, what just ended up happening is, and this is pretty typical, you get your, your technology in place and it just sits there. 
there are ads, right? There's changes and the way a lot of those those agreements are written is there is just this natural progression and they were paying a significant amount for what they had in place. And I said, have you ever considered looking at cable or if there's fiber optic in the area and you know, just did a quick search on my phone, looks like you've got three other vendors you could look at, have you considered that? And it took a multi hundred dollar bill down to 50 bucks by switching to a new vendor. Now, you don't always get to lock into that price for a significant amount of time, but just as a simple, what can a tech provider do for you? you is a simple question like that can save you hundreds of dollars per month but to kyle's point too it can help you with stepping up your business as well so i think on the small business end it's it seems like yeah they definitely need the help but it, one of the the hurdles that they're running into is um you know financing like how if i just have bob you know and, and bob's who i got and i can afford i mean um, how does that conversation with a tech partner go when you say, you know, I got like five employees. I don't know if a tech partner is right for me. Well, I would, I usually like to lead into those again to get to that. It's not what it costs, it's what it's worth. And I think you have to take a step back and, and separate those two because to Todd's example, he just gave, again, you may be getting free or very low cost services from somebody that's got technical aptitude and just moonlighting or something on the side, but, you know, they're missing the, the objective of the speed of the internet and those overall costs of those things, how that's affecting the productivity of the business. You're, you're losing dollars every single day because you didn't you know, it just brings somebody in that's just got a little more insight as to how to improve the productivity of your workers. And then all of a sudden, boom, you know, and the smaller you are, the more almost immediate that can be, you know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, when when you're wearing a lot of hats and you're trying to service your customers, I mean, it that that can be a real killer, you know, just trying to get something done is taking so long or you're troubleshooting your Wi-Fi continuously and, or, you know, God forbid you get, uh, you know, a cybersecurity incident or those things, how impactful those can be. So, you know, there's, it's worth it just to do it and get it done right and bring the right person in will pay dividends um, in the long run. Yeah, one of the things I like to lean on is return on investment, and, and that's what Kyle is really saying. It is um, not something that all small businesses are looking at consistently, especially when it comes to technology. They're not looking at it saying, well, if I spend this, I get this in return, but that's exactly what Kyle highlighted, right? Um, a great example would be this business thought they could get away with an iPad as their main computing tool set, or they're using a Chromebook, and then the reality is, is they're trying to build quotes, or they're trying to process the 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 cash whatever transaction and it's being slow or and you guys have probably all experienced it right you go in and they're like oh the computer's causing me problems how many times have you gone to check out and that's the comment you get oh the co computer's causing me problems what is that costing you do you have a line of people out the door that can't check out because you're having issues with it if you invested on a really nice pc and let's just say that you're you're I was going with the iPad example. You spent a couple hundred bucks on an iPad, but if you had a thousand dollar device, would that have increased it? Would you be able to check out more people? Would you give a better experience to your customers? What is that worth? That was exactly Kyle's phrasing, right? Mm -hmm. Those are the things that aren't always considered because it's technology. You're not great at it. What you're great at is counting, whatever it is. And so you don't always think about those kinds of things, but the partner can kind of come in and quickly highlight those. They can look at things very easily and say, your internet's slow um you're spending too much on your phone system your phone system barely works whatever the case may be you can start to quickly look at those things and identify areas where you can get quick fast impact reduce costs get better deliverables etc and that's where those partners typically come in and really have a big bang for the buck yeah yeah the roi is is the right message side of it and it's just do um do an inventory and just understand that i mean it is it's true pretty much all businesses the Labor is the, is the most expensive cost to every business that's out there. And even if you're a business of one or you're a business of a thousand, it's always your time or all your people's time that add up. And it doesn't take much, you know, and it multiplies. So a thousand people being affected by an internet outage or slow internet really gets to be a big ROI quickly. Um, 
But again, likewise, when you're a small business and it's just you or a couple people, again, you're still feeling a significant impact because you don't have that much extra time to give. And wherever you're spending your time, if you're troubleshooting your technology or you got a slow computer, the computer you bought off eBay because you wanted to only spend a few dollars is ultimately costing you a multiple more in your productivity loss than if you just gone out and bought a brand new current model is typically what what probably should have been done um, in most cases to come in there because you hear horror stories. We walk into it all the time that they went by the cost map factor. They had a technology. Somebody was advocating it on cost alone and says, mm-hmm. no, we just want to buy something cheap. We don't have a lot of money. And they literally say, I want to buy something cheap. And it's like, yeah. well, the people using it aren't cheap. So why, why are you giving them the cheap tools? You know, those are always the things that always just we want them to just take a step back and say, this is ultimately costing you a lot more than you think. Yeah, I think a lot of these things, you know, as we sort of move up on the the tier to maybe like a medium sized business, which is um, at least our kind of bread and butter. Um, but, you know, what are the differences in pros and cons when it comes to working with a tech partner um, with a medium business? I sort of think about it as they probably have a team. Um, maybe some of their employees are a little bit more tech savvy. So what does it look like for them to have a tech, tech partner? Yeah, with the medium sized organizations, it's usually is it's getting them focused on the business applications and the business um, how they use technology specifically within their business and trusting the partner to do the general IT support need sides around the patching, the asset inventory, you know, up down monitoring, all those types of things that are, you know, just very general support. But to have one person or a couple of people internally do that really takes away again, doesn't necessarily move the company forward on how technology is servicing them and, and or their customer sides with it. So strategically engaging those, as well as having that partner available for knowledge um, supplement, supplementation when you need it. So when you have a project, when you need to do a new initiative, or you're gonna go through an acquisition or whatever it may be, you can you know engage that partner, bring in the additional help when you need it, and then have them pull back when you're back to a normal operational and support mode side of it. So it's it's we we see organizations that tend to you know feel like their on-site IT needs to know everything about everything and they need to you know do it and, and carry that full burden side of that really is just not realistic in in this day and age you just can't do it you know that that it's too big of a um, too big of a of a roadmap to try to cover it all it's a lot of ground um, and mistakes are going to be made and there's going to be things that just don't happen. And that leads to other more business impacting outages, things, you know, it can be as far as a really bad cybersecurity incident because they didn't have time to pay attention to patching or deploy the right security tools or the knowledge to know what security tools they should use to, you know, just, you know, misconfigured firewalls or things that were left undone, um, you know, poor password management, accounts that weren't deactivated. I mean, there's just numerous things that happen. Um, when it's just on one person, it's not that they didn't have the knowledge or skills, it's just they're spread too thin. And then ultimately they're not focused on where, you know, as a technology partner, we don't know the businesses generally as, you know, certainly as well as they do in their customer sides of it, but we know general IT very, very well. Um, and we can do that extremely well. And that's true of most tech partners. They can come in, they can do that incredibly well. Um, and provide that augmentation services to really allow that person then to make sure that their sales team, their, their, their manufacturing, whatever it may be, that the technology is getting handled correctly for what they need. So, Todd, anything you want to add on that? What, what am I going to say after all that? No, I, I agree a lot of it. I was trying to figure out where I was going to come in next and kind of fill in, but you covered a ton of ground and it makes a lot of sense. You will see in some medium-sized businesses where um, IT reports to somebody who may not be very technical. So we we will run into that too. And so Kyle touched on that already is do you need that additional expertise? And, and I think it makes sense to kind of highlight that in the senses, even when they do have technical expertise, those people are very 
spread thin very, very often. And they it is very hard for a technical person to know everything. Um, so cybersecurity was a great example. Cybersecurity guys are very, very specialized. They just are just because there's so much to it. It's a very broad topic and there's a lot to know in it. And those individuals are very expensive. So when you're looking at medium sized businesses, they typically don't have the expertise in every vertical. Um, so that that's one of the reasons why they'll typically look for a tech partner. And then the other part that that Kyle mentioned and I wanted to highlight it is I, I always try to explain it to um, leadership in the sense of when a, a partner comes in and they bring in automation or they're bringing in the stuff that you can easily automate, you're freeing up your your team to do the highly strategic work. It's the stuff that drives the business further instead of just doing like Kyle mentioned, the patching, the updating, the reboots, the password changes, et cetera. Those things you can really streamline and you can use tech partners to help you get those things done. And then you can actually start focusing on the things that matter. A line of business app that you're not getting the right reporting out of or tuning up your SQL server or whatever the case may be, you can focus on the things that truly matter and less of the day-to-day -day things. We've run into many cases where um... You know, when you talk about the tool sets that a tech partner brings in, that is that automation Todd's talking about for how you manage your desktops and monitor your servers and inventory of those system sides of it. Why you can go out and deploy these internally again and bring these even in as an internal application again, that requires now focus inside. They are not automatic. So it's usually I've had these conversation sites to say, you know, we have multiple full time employees that just manage those platforms. So for you to take your internal resources and now say you're going to devote a, a high percent of your time to manage the management platform itself, just is something they don't think about. They think it's, uh, oh, I'll do this capital acquisition or I'll pay this monthly fee for this piece of software and it's just going to do all this work for me and then I don't have to pay this technology partner. Well, that that's only the acquisition cost. The management cost is where you know the rubber hits the road and it's where most of the time gets spent. And again, it's that other ROI component. There's a large cost side to it because many times we come in and, and customers have invested in the past into these platforms and they are collecting you know, technology dust. They are not used, they're not used correctly or they basically were abandoned because they just gave up because um, it's just too much for them and they just lost the priority for it. So it was shiny for a while, they tried it, and just forgot about it. So again, that was just money probably not well spent. It's just yeah. that it happens far too often. Cybersecurity falls into the same category too. Um, or you would deploy the tool, it's up, it's running, I don't need to pay attention to it. And that does tail really well into the cybersecurity point I was going to make is you bring in a tool set, whether it's endpoint detection response or something else that's potentially more robust. And those things create a lot of additional information that you need to, to sort through to be completely blunt about it and it does take a lot of time and attention to go through all of it and a lot of companies will kind of go wow it's really not that big of a deal my team's got it we really don't get that many alerts but if you look in the cybersecurity world all of those alerts do matter and um you will find that as people do that and they focus heavily on it there's a ton of burnout that goes with it so conceptually what you'd be looking at as a, a tech partner in that situation is you're for all intents and purposes you're outsourcing that burnout to somebody else you don't have to worry about your one guy that you would lean on for everything day in and day out getting burned out and going i've had enough i'm out so yeah. that would be another good reason as well and if they're looking at the cybersecurity tools who's looking at the backup tool who's looking at the monitoring tool who's looking at Who's taking care of the user requests for the applications? Who's handling the upgrade? I mean, again, you can start to put together real quickly how it just gets, um, you know, under underserved. Some area gets ignored. There's only, you know, multitasking is a myth. You can't multitask. They're only looking at one thing. They're task switching. So they're going to look at one thing and the other stuff's going to get ignored until they do the attention and it's just going to go around. But something is not getting handled right. So it makes a lot of sense to strategically outsource what makes sense, you know, um, and it gets back to getting everything organized, know what you got, automate what you can, and then outsource what makes sense. That's the best way to approach. Bob's a busy guy, in case anybody wants to know. Yeah, Bob is busy. <laughs> Bob's busy. He's dealing with some burnout. He's going. 
Um, well, as our business kind of grows, um, maybe Bob now has a full, robust IT department. He's got some security guys. I mean, we're talking like large companies. Um, would a tech partner in that circumstance even be worth it? You know, if they've got a full team, if they've got, you know, their different departments, what does a tech partner look like for them? Those are typically very strategic side with it. So it's usually a lot of project related services sides of it. They tend to, you know, are large groups. Again, as you mentioned, have teams. So they have knowledge, they get trained, you know, in many ways. So the the daily maintenance side of it, they do have people that they have the full-time employees done the management systems, those things typically side of it. But when they're ready for upgrades, again, they're managing that already. When they need an upgrade, they don't have the extra time or bandwidth to do that and still do their their main job. So bring in the technology partner, help augment, handle the project, transition back to operations, customer takes over the operation size up and then move on. So it tends to be very, very project focused and very strategic as to how we get engaged. Yeah, and I think those larger companies typically know what, what they're needing additional help with because there's a lot of different things that come out there. So if you're in a large company and you have compliance, there's always a, a need for a third party validation. So you could potentially looking at it as a partner that comes in completely independent from you that's coming in and validating. Um, and as Kyle mentioned, there's all kinds of projects that could be switching. It could be firewall. It could be cybersecurity remediation. There's a lot of stuff that does take additional resources. And as we mentioned, and this is true across all sizes of businesses, and most business leaders already know this, but you have limited resources. And ultimately, your IT guy can be, or gal, can be full 100% all the time and it then becomes what is the priority where a tech partner potentially comes in and helps make a boon is you've got the ability to kind of toggle an on off switch of how much you want to ramp up to something i've got a very specific project i want to get in before the summer is over um schools would be a great example i'm going to quick toggle up i'm going to outsource this piece and then i'm going to I'm going to pull it back down and I'm going to be able to control my costs. So it becomes a very easy variable expense for them to manage. I can budget for it. I can plan for it. I can use it and then I'm going to take it away. Or it can be something that's very supplemental. So you got that very specific technology need that you need. Again, going back to the example that I met, met, uh, mentioned with the security alerts is it's a lot of information. And if you could potentially outsource that at a reasonable cost, that might be desirable. So those are some good options that would potentially be out there as well. Yeah, and there's that knowledge augmentation. They may recognize, for example, that they want to do a, a zero trust deployment. They want to do a you know some zero trust platform deployment, but they don't have the experience yet. You know, they may have done some initial training side of it, but they don't feel like they're ready for implementation because they've just never done it before. So again, bringing the technology partner, let them do. Uh, the assistance uh, or do the initial deployment of it and allow them they'll shadow through that deployment and then be ready to take over the operations after some handoff and training and then have that tech partner kind of be the uh, point of escalation when they feel like okay I'm something not familiar with I'll engage this tech partner and see if they have some familiarity so you know there's some escalation of troubleshooting those things that that occurs in those sides so very augmentative yeah, one last thing that I'd throw on that just to kind of highlight it is um, because your tech partners tend to be across industry, healthcare, finance, manufacturing, et cetera, they tend to see everything. So they're much more likely to have that additional expertise that Kyle is referring to. So when you get stuck, it's certainly possible. And, and most companies have, have felt this before, right? It's even when the small company you reach out and say, hey, Bob, I don't know how to do this. Bob has a, a, at least a thought of what to go on because he's got a lot more experience in that technical area than a lot of other organizations. So the tech partners do have that wide breadth that does give them those additional insights. And they work with a ton of vendors. So when people are looking for what's the right tool, how do I know it's a good fit, your partners typically can do it. Most of them aren't just schlepping SKUs. Some may be, but most of them aren't. I was going to bash a very large one that I'll leave it alone but um <laughs> but but that's what that is their job that is their business model and they will have the ability to say hey we looked at x y and z and the reason why we picked y is because of all of this information and they can help you through that process as well 
Yeah, I think yeah and the, the tech partner yeah. can have access to some additional levels of technical support too that the uh, the customer may not be able to get to because of certain certification levels or partner level size of those. Um, we can leverage access to a higher level of support, which again is another reason to potentially engage them on the troubleshooting process or escalation process because they may be a lot quicker than the direct vendor support. Um, is, is the way a lot of times they get structured. Certainly depends on the product and other sides, but in many cases that seems to be the model that is leveraged is have your staff certified. Once they're certified, if you're certified partner side of it, you go to this direct to this tier support. You don't go to the first tier and wait and then troubleshoot side of it. The partners typically skip those first initial tiers and get right to more knowledge related experts, which expedites the troubleshooting process. So I wouldn't be, you know, doing my due diligence if I didn't ask, is there ever a time when a tech partner is not right? And then I'll kind of open it up for, for closing thoughts. No. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end no. of our <laughs> Again, it, like that, no. that's pretty broad. It really depends. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it certainly does. really depends. I the, the one thing that comes to mind directly, Ariel, on that side of it again is with very verticalized applications. When you go much, you know, that are, you know, part of the the line of business application, for example, whatever you know your ERP system is and how are you using the ERP to, to service your customer size of those. Again, very that's very specialized and not that there aren't, again, consultants that can probably come in and drive into that. If we're talking more general technology partners, what we've kind of been speaking of here, typically not your not your group. Um, you know, for, for CIT, for example, when people have using Salesforce or they're using Microsoft CRM, that's not us. You know, we, we're, we're more of the technology plumbers is kind of the way I get into it, making sure that the speeds, the feeds, the users accessibility, their devices are secure and performance is there and they have accessibility to get to Salesforce. But once they log into Salesforce, we don't know. Um, you know, and that's so usually once it gets deep into those things, that's another consultant or something better served, you know, by a champion in the business themselves. Yeah, my feedback was going to be when you have the expertise is when you wouldn't need the partner, but you wouldn't even be looking in those situations. <clears throat> the one that I do want to caution on, though, would be when you don't have the money, which would be probably a natural thought for most people. But I think the having the real good conversation about what is the worth and what is the ROI, that probably is a different conversation than what your first reaction is. I don't have the money for that. Um, it, it would be worth a conversation to figure out whether it would be worth spending some additional dollars or reallocating them, if that makes more sense. Yeah, just better planning in that case, you know, whether you don't have it now, but plan, you know, plan for it ahead of time so you can allocate it will pay dividends, just like you're essentially savings for the right full deployment. So yep. save, save up to do it right. You'll actually be probably much happier with the results long term than than cutting corners. Yeah, so my, my closing thoughts are, um, in most cases, a tech partner makes sense. Um, they can help you strategically and kind of tailing off the last thing that Kyle said is that budget cycle is important. If you're thinking it is something that you need to be considering, if you've put the time and energy into planning for it, you can typically figure out how to pay for it. If it's next year, or you've built a plan to say, how do I put this in in phases? Zero trust was one of the things that Kyle mentioned earlier. That's not a, I put in a tool, it works. It's a process you need to plan and you need to work on it. It takes time. But if you build the plan, you build the budget, you can get there from here. Yeah, yeah. Planning's key on it, um, you know, and I, the last thing I was going to say is, you know, when you engage a, the technology partner, there's many things they'll offer just, you know, the advice just from the initial engagement side of it. So, you know, if you're not sure if you haven't, you know, start a conversation. That's typically, you know, no obligation. It's not costing anything to just have a conversation and see if there's an alignment and there's a value side of it. There's, you know, I know for us, the initial conversation, get out there and talk and do that discovery. And even like Todd was mentioning on the internet side of it, that that that's just, you know, typically falls under a sales engagement. That's just an introductory, you know, side to see if there's an alignment. That's cost of your, a little bit of your time, but that discovery could give you some better insight as to, 
is it the right technology partner for me and is there potential you know roi that i can see come out of that that's that's just an investment a little bit in your time um you know so you don't really have to go deep into your into your budget to to worry about that just set aside some time i love it that was all very informative i love we we touched on more than it you know it's strategic it's planning it's budget there's so much more that goes into having a tech partner and it costs nothing to look it costs you know a conversation is often free so thank you kyle and todd for joining us today um if you enjoyed this podcast please like subscribe if you have a question or topic or you enjoyed this more um you know strategic and business conversation please let us know reach out to us at info at cit-net.com or head out to our website cit-net.com slash podcast and we'll be back next week with an all-new episode